Hey, it's Andy here. It has been a crazy 2018 already with so much going on in the markets we watch from the U.S. government shutdown to the ECB meeting to the rise in global equity prices. And we've got some great guests coming up that we're working on to cover important topics from from gold to Europe to U.S. interest rates. It's going to be a lot of fun, but they're not done yet. However, given the recent rise of commodity prices, we thought it would be a great time to go back and listen to an interview we did with City's Global Head of Commodity Research, Ed Morris. Please enjoy and look for the new shows coming soon. And thanks for listening. This week, we travel to the core of the agency, commodities. These are the things that influence our entire lives, bread and meat at the grocery store, gasoline at the pump, lumber for building or rebuilding, like what's happening in Texas and Florida. A wide range of commodities impact our lives and and really make a difference if these costs go up or down, how that flows. All of these things are important for our markets that we monitor and regulate. To this end, we need to understand what's going on and driving the values of these commodities. And to do that, we bring on today's guest, Ed Morse. He's the global head of commodity research at City in New York City. Mr. Morse has had a long career in this space. He's been a deputy assistant secretary of state for international energy policy. He was the U.S. representative at the IEA under Carter and Reagan. He co-founded PFC Energy. He was president of Petroleum Intelligence Weekly, and among other stops at Hess Energy, Lehman Brothers, Lewis Capital, and Credit Suisse in this energy space. Whew. With all that, Ed, welcome to CFTC Talks. Thanks, Andy. It's a pleasure to be with you. Hey, before we get to the commodity markets, I'd like to ask you about your career, because I think it's fascinating, especially the beginning of it. As I mentioned, you had a wide range of experiences in energy and commodity space and government, with most occurring during the first really big energy crisis in the United States in the 1970s, when OPEC first had a global impact on the markets, I mean, in a big way. What were the top lessons or experiences you took away from that time, Ed? Well, there were two kind of major lessons I think I learned from them. One was that uh, commodity markets are highly politicized. Uh, mm. And even as markets have uh, become more liberal, uh, they still remain politicized. And it's fundamentally a function of the concentration of really cheap oil and gas in the Middle East and other countries that became OPEC countries. And also because you know, commodities in general are the largest chunk of the global economy, mm-hmm. the largest chunk of international trade, and looming the largest in that part of global trade are things like oil, things like grains, or to put it in terms of domestic politics, food and fuel, and inflation issues that arise throughout the world, but particularly in emerging markets. So it's, uh, uh, it's highly politicized. The second thing I learned about commodities in general was that they change. The the whole framework for commodities changes rapidly, sometimes more rapidly than you think. And when I was in the government, the world was moving from fixed prices to market uh, determined prices. That may have been the kind of the the biggest one of all. But as we see in financial markets today, the unbelievable growth in the financialization of uh, commodity markets markets, which is what the CFTC is all about, uh, is relentless and uh, and has not stopped changing. And to some degree, it's even accelerated uh, over the past five years. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. Two really solid takeaways from that time. Well, with this in mind, you know, help our audience understand, and broadly speaking, how you approach researching and understanding the commodity markets. I know that's a big question, but like, what are some of the top things you focus on every day to get a picture of what's driving values? Yeah, so certainly we keep track of supply and demand. That's kind of critical to understanding market direction and price formation. That's become in many ways more difficult. And the reason it's become more Mm. difficult is that as emerging markets have become increasingly dominant in the international economy, we have more and more black holes. (laughs) And the black (laughs) holes are really extraordinary. Well, when you say black holes, is that because you just, the information and data coming out of those countries is just, it's hard to get? 
it's impossible to get. I mean, just think about <laughs> the current OPEC effort to reduce inventories of oil and gas around the world. Right. Uh, and we know, you know, we know what inventories are pretty well in OECD countries like the U.S., the European Union, and OECD Asia, uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. We have a pretty decent idea in some other countries. Saudi Arabia is very good, for example, okay. at posting their inventories of products and crude oil, as is Brazil. But by and large, emerging markets are a big black hole. And even China, which produces a lot of statistics, has a lot of missing barrels, a lot of missing molecules, a lot of missing tons of grain, uh, because their inventory is really a state secret. Mm -hmm. And the more they try to make it transparent, they still don't erase the big secret. So black holes are in getting larger and larger and impacting our understanding of fundamentals. The other thing that uh, we focus on, of course, is GDP growth because demand is basically a function still of uh, GDP growth and fixed asset investment and per capita income and industrial production. So you've got to you've got to look in trying to figure out demand and demand patterns at uh, indirect indicators like FAI or fixed asset investment and per capita disposable income. And then not uh, not the least of it is financial flows, which are peculiar and uh, and have multiple parties involved in those flows going in and out of commodities through exchanges, including the big ones that you monitor, but elsewhere in the world. The fastest growing exchanges are in China, and they become a haven for speculative investors, and the government is continuing to play catch up with the investor flows, uh, but you got to look at them because they have a really significant impact. Yeah, and I think the price movements in, in steel and copper recently underscore that. I mean, they, they're parabolic at times. So right. it, it really uh, highlights uh, what you just said. Well, l- let me ask you this. All right. L- let's get on to what is happening now in the markets and so much what is, again, focused on energy. What are the top things that you're looking at of, of what's driving energy prices? You just talked about the top overall things. What do you see specifically with energy and what is it telling you about the current state of the market? Sure. So um, we have an incredible twofold change in markets in terms of liquidity and trading over time. So, you know, markets have developed to enable us to figure out where prices might be or where the market is telling us the supply and demand of deferred contracts are. Okay. Um, and we've had, uh, again, focusing on oil, which is the most liquid of all of, of all the commodities that are traded on exchanges. In the period of time since Dodd-Frank went into effect, so since January 2014, there's been about a 40% increase in liquidity, that is the amount of contracts being traded over time. And that's not insignificant. No. And it's true of all other commodities, too. I mean, maybe the grains have lagged the metals, but most commodities have seen that dramatic increase in investor interest in one way or another. But accompanying this has been another dramatic change, and that is the growth has been concentrated in the prompt contracts. So the first six months, first 12 months, first 18 months, Mm -hmm. uh, that's been where the mushrooming has taken place. And there's been a drying up of liquidity actually a drop in contracts traded, the more deferred you go, uh, certainly three years and beyond. And that's had several impacts. One of them is that by and large, the deferred price of a commodity is no longer a decent indicator of uh, where prices are expected to go. And that's because there is not a fair balance of buyers and sellers in the in the deferred contract space. Mm-hmm. And just to give you kind of a simple example of the consequences of this, when the when some regulators like the uh, Federal Reserve Bank or uh, the Office of the Controller of the Currency try to think about credit issues and try to uh, make sure that 
that the financial sector is going to remain solvent and healthy and where banks ought to be lending or not lending, they use forward curves as an indication of price. But the forward curve is really broken, and it doesn't look like it's readily fixable in, with respect to this one kind of function of a forward curve mm-hmm. as giving a sense of fair market value. And there, unfortunately, is no other decent transparent indicator of fair market value. So that second change, the concentration of liquidity in the prompt, has really serious uh, consequences that go beyond just the commodity markets themselves. Let me ask you this. Like, from your perspective, and I know a lot of things changed when we got commodity index funds involved in in the early 2000s, and then, of course, the development of the ETFs that go into commodities, gold, oil, grains, and such – uh, of those people, where do they fall, like, in the duration and, and in the curve? I mean, the shorter-term guys are, are who? Well, I mean, that's really interesting because I guess the average guy on the street who doesn't know much about commodities think that it's speculation that gives these wild changes in the prompt price. And we've seen these wild changes uh, particularly in the past three years where uh, a year ago and in 2015 and in 2014, the range at which oil, for example, was being priced was $25 a barrel. That's not particularly a stable number. Uh, (laughs) No. No, it's, it makes it difficult for people who use energy to try to figure out what the price is, what they should hedge at. So that's just the prompt price. And, and the, as you indicated, there are new things happening. And it's not speculators who are in the, involved in the rapid high volatility trading or high frequency trading in the prompt contracts. It's, it's really three separate and not necessarily related uh, kinds of uh, factors that are at work. So, yes, you mentioned index funds. Index funds blossomed after 2003, and particularly when we had commodity prices in the so-called super cycle of commodities between 2003 and 2008, when prices across many commodities tripled or quadrupled or went up uh, even more than a fourfold. And uh, index funds became a way that investors were investing in a commodity for the long haul, except they invest in the prompt contract or the prompt two months and sometimes mm. stretched out to the prompt six months. But they're not they, – the irony is that they are – representing investors who are looking at the long term for their investment, but are expressing it in a short-term indicator. And they roll a contract usually from one month to the next, but there are a lot of you know fancy enhancements around it. Sometimes it's two months, sometimes in some kind of enhanced uh, indices, it could be a jump of six months down the curve on the roll, but the roll happens. And uh, these indices can sometimes represent, depending on other liquidity, 45 to 55 percent of the total open interest in the prompt contract. My goodness. And when they roll, they have an impact. And I know this is a podcast that is durable, but uh, we had one of these index contracts going off the screen in the roll in a five-day business trading roll yesterday. And because there is selling of one month and buying of the next month, the selling of that month of the index roll almost always tends to have a downward price move. And we saw uh, that with a 60 cents from peak to trough as the contract was rolling off the screen from the roll yesterday. And then the price rebounded back to where it was yesterday when the contract uh, trading opened up again this morning. So this is a regular feature. But the market has gotten used to the index rolls and the concentration of uh, liquidity in the prompt from them. But starting in around 2008, so the second half of 2008, right. When we had the financial crisis of that wonderful year, there were two safe havens that investors went into, the U.S. dollar and gold. And gold ETFs were invented at uh, a little earlier than that, but they took off because it enabled an investor, and this is you know, the function of the markets that the CFTC uh, supervises, investors 
find it uh, much better to invest in a financial contract than in physical gold as a safe haven or invest in oil or grain rather than in the physical commodity itself. It's cheaper. It doesn't have the inconvenience of holding it. In the case of grains, it doesn't have the inconvenience of deterioration and rats running around silos. Right. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a much more convenient investment tool. So uh, investments surged in uh, gold ETFs and trading in the ETFs, which is like the index fund, is where an investor, uh, usually a retail investor, tries to invest for the long haul because they think gold prices are going to go up, but they express it in the prompt contract as well. Mm. In the oil market and the gas markets, we've had periods of time when uh, ETFs that are physically backed have become prominent. In the oil market, it really was as oil prices started sliding in 2014, and ETFs represented about 1% of the market at the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, it represented about 10% of open interest. By the time we got to 2016, it was 40% of total open interest in the prom contract. Now, the ETF market, unlike the total assets under management in the index structures, are much more fickle. The, the investors tend to go in and out. Okay. Uh, and when you buy the prompt, you tend to bid up the price. And when you sell the prompt, you tend to accelerate the price. So it has an impact in the market of exaggerating what the trends are and sometimes making the upward trend faster than the market response in 2015, for example, we saw the ETF explosion uh, bringing up the prompt price. And those of us looking at fundamentals at the same time were puzzled because we saw oil inventories growing and growing and growing while the price was going up. And it took a while for the fundamentals to kind of take over in that. So that's the kind of second set of investors in the prompt. And the third are also something that's relatively new in the market, namely uh, black box trading houses or mm -hmm. uh, algorithmic traders. And this is a phenomenon that's not directly a function of the commodity markets per se. It's a function of big data. And big data and tapping into big data has become a way for trading houses and traders in general to try to outsmart the market. Uh, that's smart the market by looking at trends through a chart, but the chart can be based on really very large data. And I think that's what's created daily volume volatility. Uh, and it's been a way that investors have both been able to think about making money on their investments through short-term rapid in and out from the market as a better and more trustworthy way of investing than, than looking at market fundamentals, which you know has been riddled by these black box or black holes that I talked about earlier. Right. And I think what's interesting from when we talk about liquidity and volume, those are kind of two different things to some extent. And I just want to clarify this for people who are listening, because you can have much higher volumes with high frequency traders or algorithmic traders, but the liquidity may not necessarily be there. It may be masked by that. And what you're saying too as well, the good news is as far as the liquidity goes for these markets, because of the advent of these type of ETFs, CIT uh, investment instruments, that that's helped swell also the open interest, which is where you see people holding positions for long periods of time or longer periods of time. Because typically HFTs, I'm guessing here, but I'm asking your opinion, is that they're pretty much, they don't hold, they can hold open interest for sure. Um, that doesn't mean they're not allowed to, but generally they don't hold open interest as, as large as these other entities. Absolutely correct. They okay. uh, they have much greater volatility in their trading, and you know these other entities, ETF owners and ETF uh, and 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 holders, uh, which are largely pension funds and long term money managers. The role is what counts. There's greater stability uh, in both of those universes than there is in the high frequency trading community. Yeah, L let me just switch gears a little bit to talk about another source of liquidity and trading volume, and that is the spectacular rise of open interest in trading in China's commodity exchanges. 
Yeah, and we're looking this year at the oil exchange uh, operating in Shanghai. They postponed this five years already, and uh, it doesn't look like they're going to postpone it any any longer. And this can be even bigger. Now, you know, just to get a sense of total AUM in um, in, in the oil market, we have. Three hundred to four hundred billion dollars worth of investment from index holders, and the combined investment in U.S. dollar terms on all the Chinese exchanges combined is around sixteen billion U.S. dollars. So it's growing at an unbelievable rate, doubled in the last year and a half. Wow! Uh, but it's still small in scale, and when I say mm-hmm. small in scale, that's because when we look at indices in the U.S., they are significantly based on the most liquid of all commodities contracts, and those are the oil contracts, the ICE contract for Brent and the WTI contract on the CME NYMEX. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you look across the most liquid contracts in the world and look at the top 20, China's got six of them. It will perhaps get a seventh one when their oil contract emerges. And the liquidity in the three biggest contracts is NYMEX, WTI, Ice Brent and IMEX Gold. The fourth most liquid contract is is the steel contract on the Shanghai Exchange, and that's got half of the liquidity that gold on the NYMEX has. So these are big in terms of commodity markets if you've set aside oil and gold. And increasingly, as the overall liquidity has doubled, the volatility in those Chinese exchanges has also exploded, and the government and the regulators have had a hard time controlling that volatility, which is actually spilled over into uh, other contracts. And, you know, we've seen it this past summer, right? actually the third quarter as a whole, has been a quarter in which we've seen two different trends in the markets. We've seen the bulk commodity complex and the base metals commodity complex seeing spectacular price rises. Uh, and we've seen either range-bound trading or loss of value in a lot of the other traded commodities. Mm -hmm. So it's been a puzzle in a way. Normally, we used to think that uh, when commodities all rise together, the dollar has an impact. The value of the dollar uh, is one of the things you have to look at in right. thinking about commodities because they're mostly traded in in U.S. dollars. But these metals contracts and the bulk contracts are do- denominated significantly by the renminbi because it uh, they're they're all China based. And fifty to eighty percent of some of these tr- real trading underlying the, f- the financial trading it takes place with China. And uh, as not so much the dollar goes down. Down, but as the renminbi rises, the commodities that are linked to the Chinese economy tend to go up. There's a negative dollar correlation, of course, but it's really the positive renminbi correlation. And uh, when do the Chinese authorities intervene on the credit side or on the currency side, that has a direct impact of pricing on the Chinese exchanges and the commodities that are China-based respond in terms of their prices. And because underlying this is a physical market that's global, it has an impact on copper prices or iron ore prices traded in Europe or the U.S. just as much, uh, just as equally they're traded uh, on uh, Chinese exchanges. So to that end, you know, when you look at these commodities in China, and and I, before I let you go, I'm going to ask you this question, but uh, w- we've heard you know, the discussion about the Silk Road and how that would generate demand for these commodities within China. So I guess my question to you is this, as you look out in your crystal ball for the rest of the 2017, what what are your top three things that you're looking at? Is the Silk Road and the move towards that, is that one of them? Well, certainly China is one of them. So, you know, putting the Silk Road in perspective, um, this is an effort to accomplish two things. I think one is to find a way to deal with the overcapacities that have been built up in China and without shutting down industry. Um, We've got, you know, steel is the biggest example of this where they had overcapacities built up because for 20 years from 
1990 to 2010, the engine of growth in China was frenetic fixed asset investment. It was like reconstruction in Europe or, or, or Japan after World War II or what happened in the boom years of the 1950s and 60s in the U.S. when we had public sector investment in building a national highway system, for example. Mm -hmm. So this, this in China had, as its result, building 226 cities of a million people or more. Some of them were 10 million people over a 20-year period of time. You needed an awful lot of steel. You used an awful lot of diesel, a lot of cement to build those cities. And now they stopped building them, but they have the capacity to, to continue to build 10 <laughs> cities of a million people or more. So rather well, than well, and that ties into the upcoming Congress. Right? Are they going to yeah. tell us like what they're going to – I mean, do, do you anticipate that? I'm talking about the Politburo Congress in China, which is coming up, uh, the 19th National Congress of the Communist Party, and that's on October 18th. Yeah, so, you know, the way this all comes together is people are looking at Chinese growth, and the Chinese growth has been erring to the upside at 6.8% for the rest of the year when people thought it was going to be below 6 mm -hmm. at the beginning of the year. And there's a belief that in preparation for that party congress, which is not an annual event, but more like a decadal event, that the growth and aiming for stability that the government has put an emphasis on will end once the party congress is over. So one of the things to watch is Chinese policy in building that Silk Road and in use of the renmin be as an internationally traded currency and whether growth is going to really lag after the party congress yeah. or whether it can be sustained. And that, that's the kind of big debate. But that's one of the three top events in our mind, at least for the rest of the year. Okay. So what are the other two? So the other two is really the OPEC meetings. We have periodic OPEC meetings that involve monitoring the OPEC agreement. But the big one is on, is on November 30th, when they're going to look really hard at whether to extend their production cut beyond where it now is, the end of the first quarter in 2018, whether they go to the end of the second quarter, the end of the third quarter, which should have an impact on expectations of where the price of oil is going to be, whether they not only look at the extension, but look at the level of the production cut and whether they increase it or not. So uh, I think that's going to be a significant event in terms of the most liquid of all the contracts that are traded. Okay. And then I guess finally, uh, we have to look at what banks are doing around the world. There was an expectation at the beginning of this year that the Trump administration was going to be in a frenzy of infrastructure build, and that right. would lead to the Federal Reserve Bank tightening up uh, markets with rate increases. And now, the inflationary concerns are, are no longer there, and since the dollar is now sliding as a result of that, that certainly has an impact on commodities. We have not just the Fed, but we have the Bank of England, where we expect a rate increase. We have the European uh, Central Bank, which is expected to taper away from quantitative easing, and all of these decisions really impact commodities. They impact decisions on which commodities to invest in and, and what the direction of change is going to be. So I think, you know, we've, we've hit upon China, the largest commodity consuming country in the world. We've hit upon OPEC, the heart and way of the largest liquid, most liquid contract that's traded in markets. And, and then we look at currencies. Uh, so these are the big, the big issues. And, and we have three sets of events coming up that make us uh, have to concentrate on what's happening. Ed Morris, Global Head of Commodity Research at City in New York. Thanks for coming on the show today. That was fun. That's it for me this week. Hey, um, do me a favor, would you? Go to iTunes and leave a review for the show. I, it, it really helps us here at the CFTC understand what your thinking is, areas that we could look at for doing additional shows, and it helps other people find the show. So in advance, I'm just going to say thanks for doing it. We'll be back next week with another guest on our quest to learn about the markets we watch. I'm Andy Bush. Thanks for listening. The 
wait, we're not done yet. It's time for a disclaimer. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service, and it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or any third party for any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages or lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in this podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provide similar services to those of the guests. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated or referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. The CFTC is providing its interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting possible outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application of a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult an attorney.